Park in Northwest Philadelphia, administered by the National Society of the Colonial James in Pennsylvania since, six, uh, since 2008. Dennis holds an MA in American Studies from Penn State and a BA from Virginia Commonwealth University. He is also an alumnus of the Addingham Summer School Program for the study of the English Country House. For the better part of a decade, Dennis has served as the president of Historic Germantown and remains active on the executive committee. This consortium of 18 historic sites, an arboretum, and an art museum located along America's longest national historic district is unique in the Philadelphia region in its efforts to harness the power of collaboration among cultural institutions. Dennis is currently the project director for Inequality in Bronze, Monumental Plantation Legacies, a multi-year project at Stenton funded by a major grant from the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage. Dennis will share insights from the project, which aims to create a community inclusive program that will result in a new memorial to a once enslaved woman named Dinah, who lived, labored, and was buried at Stenton. So Dennis, thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, we're all very excited to hear this. Well, thank you, Tina. Thank you for, for organizing this program and for inviting me to be a part of it. I appreciate the, the work that you and your staff have done to put it together. And I'm delighted to be here with you. I see some familiar faces from the Pennsylvania Society, so that's always nice to see friends in the crowd. Um, so give me just a moment here, and I'm going to share my screen and pull up a little slideshow for our discussion. Okay, is everybody seeing that okay? Great. Um, <clears throat> well, I'm going to start off by giving you a little whirlwind tour of Stenton for those of you who are not familiar with us. But um, um, as Tina mentioned, I really want to focus in today on uh, this inequality and prawns project that has been uh, such an important part of our efforts over the last couple of years. So we'll spend most of our time talking about that. But to give you a little bit of background, um, the historic house that I direct is called Stenton. It was completed in uh, 1730 by this gentleman in the upper right corner. His name was James Logan. And if you come to Philadelphia and Pennsylvania, you hear a lot about William Penn and Benjamin Franklin and some of these other folks. You hear less about James Logan. And that's unfortunate because you could really make a strong case that he was the most important and influential man uh, in the colony in the first half of the 18th century. Uh, that's in part because he was secretary to William Penn, essentially Penn's uh, right-hand man, and really managed the Penn family's affairs and the proprietorship uh, on behalf of the family. The house has also been administered by the Pennsylvania Society of the Colonial Dames since 1899. So it is, uh, it's the second, I believe it's the second um, house by the Dames after uh, Van Cortland uh, to be open to the public uh, and really is one of America's early and enduring preservation stories. So if you come to Stenton today, this just gives you a quick glimpse of what you'll experience. Um, part of what makes the house special, it's really a couple of things. One, it really wasn't lived in after about 1860. So it never had lighting, plumbing, a lot of the intrusive things that change historic houses, disrupt them. Um, and also uh, we just have a, a real wealth, a phenomenal amount of surviving original documentation, family furnishings, uh, and all of these things um, combined to create um, uh, what's been called Philadelphia's most authentic historic house. So you really are stepping back in time when you're uh, visiting Stenton. We've also done a lot of work over the last decade um, to really pull together, this has been led by our curator, Laura Kime, to pull together all of the existing documentation, information that we can find about uh, family furnishings, uh, enhancing the story and the presentation of Stenton through things like a room fur furnishing study, uh, a major conference that we held about five years ago um, on Logan and the transatlantic world, and a major uh, exhibition called Logania, where we brought back over 100 Logan objects um, from various collections uh, into the house. Uh, things like James Logan's pocket watch, which you see here, uh, this extraordinary Greek skiffos, which was uh, purportedly sent to Logan uh, and really relates to uh, the whole story of Logan's involvement uh, in the Enlightenment world. Uh, we used archaeology um, to enhance our presentation in the house, and we've been very lucky. We have um, a collection of over 200 uh, vessels that have come back together intact. And what's really remarkable is we've been able to take surviving documentation like family inventories and place those objects back in the context um, where they were originally. And this is just 
uh, another sort of extraordinary thing about Stenton that is very rare to find uh, in a historic house. We've been opportunistic with bringing Logan family objects back, like uh, this uh, tender lighter where you can see James Logan's name etched onto it. And keeping track of objects that um, are still with family members but are coming back uh, to Stenton, like this portrait of James Logan's daughter um, from this really wonderful and generous man, Peter Luxmore, who sadly just passed away but bequeathed the portrait uh, to Stenton. And uh, uh, one of uh, the really major projects that we completed just in the last few years was restoring um, the second most expensively furnished chamber in the house, which was the yellow lodging room. And for many years, it looked like this. And one of the curious questions we had was about uh, a pair of hooks in the ceiling of the room. Uh, we didn't really know what those were for, but through a lot of research, looking at things like family inventories, period sources, other both other houses, um, things like this doll house from Upper in the upper left corner that you see here, uh, doing dye analysis of family textiles that survive as well as paint analysis. We were able to um, really come up with a strong sense of what the room looked like during, during James Logan's time. And it ended up in this dramatic um, uh, refurnishing and representation of the space that you see here. But the sort of centerpiece of which is this flying tester bed and that bed is supported by those hooks in the ceiling. So unlike some later 18th century beds, there's no posts at the end. It uh, really creates this uh, dramatic uh, setting in the house. And if you like green space, we have that too. Uh, we have just under three acres on the property. Um, things that we include a, a screen of native woodland trees and plants, a meadow, and also a colonial revival garden that was established in 1911. And this garden was the setting for the founding meeting of the Garden Club of America in 1913. Um, so we're lucky enough to actually have uh, things like replies to the original invitations in our archives, as well as the menu from that day. Uh, so you can really dig into a lot of uh, different uh, eras uh, at Stenton. And of course, no historic house is complete without uh, its public facing side, uh, the visitors. Uh, like many historic houses, we offer a variety of programs, a lot of family free friendly programs, lectures, but um, uh, a real um, uh, sort of strong point of our efforts is a field trip program called the History Hunters Program. And this is a lot more than just a field trip program. It's actually a collaboration between four sites and an art museum that's led by Stenton. And by using these um, different sites, which each tell a different story, we were actually able to create a year long social studies cur curriculum which takes students on a sweep from the colonial period up through the Civil War. Um, they get classroom workbooks, they get hands-on experiences at each site. That's been a highly successful program for, for many years now. And uh, programming really uh, takes us into um, the focal point of our discussion today, which is the Inequality in Bronze Project. So what is this project about, Inequality in Bronze? Well, Tina mentioned that the, the sort of overarching goal is to work with our community to create a new memorial to a once enslaved woman named Dinah. And the genesis of the project um, came in, uh, came about kind of in 2017, when we were contacted by uh, the city of Philadelphia about the object that you see on the right hand side of your screen. And that is a memorial to James Logan, which had been created in 1939 and removed from its original context and put into storage. Um, and the city was looking for a, a place, uh, somewhere to place it and contacted us about it. Now, at the time that we were contacted about this, of course, um, this conversation about national monuments was really starting to heat up. Um, James Logan um, was an enslaver, um, so we needed to consider that. Uh, and we also needed to consider something that was already in our collection, which is the plaque that you see on the left. Now, this plaque had been erected by our society and the local historic, historical society in 1912 in Stenton Park, which is adjacent to where Stenton is located. And I'll, I'll just read the inscription to you quickly. It says, in memory of Dinah, the faithful colored caretaker of Stenton, who by her quick thought and presence of mind saved the mansion from being burned by British soldiers in the winter of 1777. So it commemorates this event um, when this woman Dinah saved the house from burning by the British during the revolution. Um, this story had really um, uh, over the centuries taken on kind of a life of its own. It had become part of um, the community, um, the community's lore. She becomes sort of a local heroine, but it's problematic for a number of reasons. You probably already noticed the language is problematic. Um, it also positions Dinah as a faithful servant, sort of in this tradition of, of 
faithful slave narratives. And we began thinking to ourselves where well, there has to be a lot more to Dinah than just the story, which is you know, what had been told about her for so many years. Um, and we also thought if we're gonna bring this Logan mon monument um, to Stenton, we need to be telling more of these stories and we need to be thinking about how we can elevate these stories, how we can give Dinah uh, the same sort of standing in the landscape along with um, the larger community of um, indentured and enslaved laborers who lived uh, at Stenton during this time. So that was sort of the background of the project. Another kind of important piece of it was the community uh, in which we are located. Um, Stenton was built as a country house in the 18th century, but over time it, it became part of the city of Philadelphia. Today it's a, in a dense uh, urban neighborhood known as Nice Town, so you get a sense of that here from some of the pictures. And if you're inside the grounds of Stenton, you're in this really sort of wonderful oasis in the city. But if you're walking on the outside, the picture in the lower right is what you see, this 10 foot high fence, which is topped by barbed wire, not a very welcoming uh, place. And Stenton historically had not really been seen as, as a part of the community for that reason. So we knew that we were gonna have to overcome that, do a lot of trust building uh, and, and connecting with our neighbors in, in new ways. So we were thinking about it and we, we sort of came up with this project, Inequality in Bronze. Um, and, and these are uh, sort of the uh, overarching goals here. Uh, first and foremost was to find a new way to work with our neighbors, a way that we had never done before, really um, uh, uh, looking at shared authority, giving our neighbors a voice in the decision-making process at Stenton for the first time. And we wanted to invite them in to help us think about how we would memorialize Dinah in the 21st century. If we were to create a memorial today, uh, how would we do that? Um, we wanted to elevate and commemorate Dinah's whole story, moving away from just this focus on her saving the house from burning um, and thinking about um, um, other people um, beyond the Logan family who lived and labored at Stenton and how do we tell their stories. And of course, we were thinking the whole time about the context of this national debate about monuments. And to me, there's sort of uh, two, two aspects to that. One is, is sort of challenging what is an appropriate monument. But the other aspect is just the lack of monuments to African Americans in our public spaces, um, not acknowledging the contributions that they've made to our history and including them in that. So uh, we approached a regional funder, the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage, and we were very fortunate to uh, get a $360,000 grant over two years that funded the project. We knew going into this that um, we were going to need a lot of help. These were uh, uh, new, new things that we were taking on, new ideas, things that we didn't have the expertise on our staff or had done before. So um, we put together uh, what turned out to be a really wonderful team of consultants. Um, the two who were sort of led uh, the charge in the upper right hand corner, you see a woman named Dina Bailey. She's worked with the International Sites of Conscience quite a bit. A really terrific facilitator, helped us have difficult conversations about uh, uh, race, enslavement, uh, just building consensus. How do we how do we all agree on what you know what we want to see in a new memorial? And then the woman in the lower left is Nisa Page Lieberman, who um, served as our public art curator for the project, really helping us think about a process to identify uh, and a community inclusive process, really to identify the best um, artist for the project. And we had lots of other support, evaluation support. Um, it, we had, it was documented throughout video documentation. We recruited a team of project advisors, and these were really um, people on the forefront of um, the whole um, topic of public monuments and how we think about them. If you've read about Monument Lab, we had two advisors um, from that project. Um, we had folks who were on the forefront of interpreting Black, Indigenous, and, and people of color's history. Um, so thinking of these things. Uh, really important was our team of community ambassadors. As I mentioned, um, you know, Stenton didn't have a strong track record necessarily of working with our neighbors. So we started, we, we sort of recruited a mixed team. One was um, uh, folks we already had relationships with, but also um, uh, folks who we didn't know, who we, we cultivated new relationships with. And, there were, um, and, and that team um, is still advising us today. So we really relied on them to help us broaden our networks. Um, to reach out to the community to help us um, build trust with our neighbors. Because we knew it couldn't just be us talking about this project. We, we, um, so um, the kind of main pillars of the project then are was a whole series of community focus groups or meetings where we um, collectively thought about the project. And importantly, we documented all of this. We have reports from each of these meetings. We have audio transcriptions. And this information was shared with the artists uh, when it became time to actually think about designing the memorial. 
Uh, and then this curator led a community inclusive process to identify um, that artist. And, and there was a whole other layer of activities, which I don't have time to get in today, but involved research, <clears throat> a partnership with a local university, a major conference, um, thinking about new exhibits, testing new kinds of interpretation. Um, research really underpinned the project from the outset. Um, again, as I mentioned, we, we didn't know a whole lot about Dinah outside of this story. So uh, we learned through this project, for instance, that she was really the one who asked for, requested and was granted her freedom. We learned that she, like so many um, people in enslaved families at the time, was separated from her husband when she came to Stenton. And at some point he became in danger of being sold away because he'd become disabled. And uh, she really convinced the Logans to help her reunite her family. Um, so um, there were just some really wonderful stories about her agency and things that she did that we didn't know and hadn't been telling um, previously that came out of this research. These community meetings were held over the stretch of almost two years. Um, and each one kind of built upon the next. Um, Dina, who you see in, on the right there, really helped us structure the meetings um, and think about what we wanted to get out of them, what the goals were. So these are just some examples of some of these discussions. You know, what we started out with just talking about kind of what people thought they knew about Dina. Um, one of the real issues we wanted to get into was this idea of the mammy stereotype and how do we challenge the faithful servant narrative. Um, you know, what we think about collectively is what the term memorial means to us. You know, do we want this to be a strictly factual representation of Dinah? Did we want it to represent kind of the values that the community felt like, you know, she represented to them? Um, these kinds of things. And Dina had, you can see on the bottom there, had these really wonderful word exercises and things that we would do with throughout the process that helped um, facilitate those conversations. You just get a little sense of that here from the pictures. Uh, another thing that was really great that came out of um, the project is we didn't have much of a relationship with Stenton Park um, prior to this, which surrounds the site. Um, <clears throat> and so we formed a park and museum community partnership with a core group of our community ambassadors and some other folks who participated. That still exists today. We've been meeting monthly up until the pandemic. That's had to shift a little bit, unfortunately, because of that. But um, you know, we wanted to collaboratively think about how we could improve Stenton Park. And one of the first things we did was uh, a community health fair. You might sort of say, well, how in the world does a community health fair fit into your mission and scope of work? And on the surface, it doesn't seem like it, but it really put us outside of our fence into the neighborhood. And we were close enough that we could open the museum that day. And I'd say we probably had 50 neighbors, at least, um, who came through who had never, never set foot in the museum before, never felt comfortable enough to come in on their own we were able to escort from the health fair over to the museum and, and you know, um, talk to them about the work that we do. So once we had uh, collected um, what we felt was a really good uh, amount of feedback and data from the community about what they wanted to see in this memorial, we started the process of selecting uh, an artist. And this is where our team of advisors uh, really came in handy. Um, the, funder that we worked with really um, uh, has uh, high standards of excellence for the artists that they want you to see. And so we knew this just couldn't be an open call. Um, so they helped us um, think about a roster of artists um, who are internationally known, who would you know, be a good fit for this project. Um, we invited them through an RFP process to submit a package. And then our team of advisors vetted those submissions. And from that, we whittled it down to three artists. Then we scheduled, um, a day where we invited all the participants from the community sessions to come and we had two sessions um, and each artist um, had a, a concept that they proposed and shared with the community. Um, and you can see those here, they, they really varied widely and any one of them I think would have been a great addition to the landscape at Stenton. But our evaluation team actually helped us create uh, a rubric for this. So it wasn't just sort of, I like this one or I like this one. Um, all the participants were given a sheet with a number of questions and they had to kind of rank um, uh, the monuments based on those questions. So we really felt like we had a fair process. Uh, and we also invited um, online feedback and, and had some other things that we collected as well. But in the end, this is the, the proposal that rose to the top and it's actually turned out to be by a Philadelphia artist um, named Karen Olivier. And you can see it's, um, <clears throat> this was just a, um, a very sort of conceptual way of looking at it. Since then, uh, Karen's been working with a landscape architect um, 
that we employ for our master landscape plan. And we've been able to kind of refine the concept. And you can see it's a very intimate space. It's meant to be really kind of a reflective space where visitors can sit and think about Dinah and her life. And um, the, the sort of featured elements of it are a pair of tablets. And you can see those in the drawings here. There's one here and one here. They have a silhouette on them and they have a series of questions that as a viewer, you are supposed to read and at least internally respond to. And they are in questions like, Dinah, what was your full name? How were you born and how did you arrive here? How did freedom feel? What was your greatest joy and your greatest sorrow? Um, so really, again, just moving beyond this idea of, you know, Dinah is all about saving the house and that's her story. Her, her story is so much more than that. And we want to think about and, and commemorate her entire life. And so on each tablet, there, there are questions for Dinah, but there are also questions for you. So you know, you're reflecting back on your own life and hopefully connecting uh, history uh, to it. Um, I'm just gonna quickly run through a few other things that were part of the project. We did a lot of prototyping and um, thinking about different ways we could um, modify interpretation, incorporate these new stories uh, that we're thinking about. Um, there's still a lot of work with interpretive planning to do. We actually had funding in the grant for a ground penetrating radar study by archeologists because we knew that the Logans had buried Dinah um, in the early 19th century. Now she, um, she became free, as I mentioned, in, 1776, uh, but she stayed on as a paid employee at Stenton uh, until the end of her life. And we thought she might be buried near where the um, uh, plaque was originally erected in Stenton Park. Unfortunately, we found nothing there. And then frustratingly, right toward the end of the project, <laughs> we've been doing research throughout this whole thing. We stumbled on an archive that we really were unaware of at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. And it included a group of uh, Logan family almanacs and in it was this almanac kept by Deborah Norris Logan. And it, it records when Dinah buried. It was on February 23rd. So the anniversary of her death is coming up. And it also notes that she had requested in her lifetime to be interred at Stenton. And that would have been in the garden on the south side of the house. We know where that is. Um, so this is a, a future archeological project to identify her final resting place and, uh, and mark it in some way, but it was really an extraordinary find um, toward the end of the project. And I think gave the weight of the memorial even more significance than, than any of us had, had felt previously. Uh, we had a whole conference that we did with, uh, in partnership with the University of Pennsylvania and other partners around the subject of Mid-Atlantic plantations uh, and worked with a group of regional scholars and uh, museum colleagues to talk about you know, again, how we can advance these new ideas of interpretation. Really thinking about Stenton for, for the better part of a century, James Logan had been the sun around which all the stories at Stenton had revolved. And we want to shift away from that uh, to thinking about Stenton.